uh, case on the show today, ahead of the conference, William Bloom. So this man is a bit of a legend in some circles. He's extremely well known. He's author of 26 books, including The Endorphin Effect and The Power of Modern Spirituality. I think he's probably best known for the intersection of health and spirituality in a sort of very down-to-earth British way. Uh, educator, activist, founder and director of the Spiritual Companions Trust. Uh, Adrian Harris, who's involved with the conference, mentioned him to me years ago. So when I saw him at the conference, I said, oh, I'd love to interview him. So William, joining us from Glastonbury, I believe. Welcome. Thank you very much. Good to be with you. How did you get interested in what you do now? What was the beginning of it for you? Well, you've got two, two separate topics here. One, one is body and health, and the other is metaphysics and spirituality. Uh, Metaphysics, spirituality was with me from the age of four or five, just a natural sense of um, the wonder of life, the blue of the sky, the and atmospheres, you know, I could always feel atmospheres. Somebody came into our house, I could immediately pick up whether they were a nice guy or not such a nice creature. And um, funnily enough, my dad was a um, psychiatrist yeah. and his, his, his intuition radar was not that great and there were kind of multiple occasions when people would come into where we lived and I would be going hello alarm bells you know little red flashing lights and my dad would be naive um, hand in hand with that was because he was an atheistic psychiatrist I couldn't chat with him about any of the um, more subtle intuitive stuff so I kind of kept quiet about it and then the embodiment stuff that didn't come until much later actually okay. yeah it didn't, it didn't happen until i was in my um, late 20s early 30s i was way up in my head way up in my head i was a novelist writer publisher editor um energy interested in energy but it always came from up in my head sense of being up in my head and then dun, 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 i <laughs> fell in love Oh, so falling in love was your gateway to the body. I felt, I felt, so I had my first embodied, fully embodied experience, right? And at, and at the same time, two other things happened. I had a friend in um, California, old old London friend in California, who had, who had, had a load of dosh, and he kept flying me over to have body work. Uh -huh. So I started experiencing body work in Esalen and down the West Coast. Uh, okay. And then at the same time, I decided to do some soft martial arts, some Tai Chi. And there was a local teacher who took it. He said he'd only take students if they'd meet him at 6 a.m. next to a river. <laughs> nice. Commitment. So he met at 6 a.m. next to a river. And um, I started to experience being in my body properly. And uh, the benefits were immense, of course. Okay, lots to open up there. So intuitive experiences at a young age, understanding maybe there's a bit more going on that it's not necessarily picked up on by everyone. And, you know, it can be obvious, kind of, it can be like, hey, why is everyone not getting this? I don't, I, it's not obvious, that guy's not to be trusted or that person's lovely or whatever it is. And realizing maybe there's another layer of communication that not everyone's picking up on. So it's something like that in the sort of early, early years? Yeah, but something bigger than that as well. It was like, okay. look, look it, there was, it's not not religious but just the kind of sense that the blue of the sky was this enormous fantastic temple okay or maybe so the, the or maybe, transcendent the profound the, just the, beauty beauty mm, the sense mm. of beauty and that went hand in hand with um from about four or five years old i remember watching if a child was being bullied at school I remember a deep instinct in me that this is not right. Mm -hmm. This is mm -hmm. not right. There needs to be an intervention. Bullying needs to stop. So there was a mixture of, of my heart opening to mm. injustice and a, and a sense of the um, sheer beauty of the cosmos. And I kind of assumed when people were using words like God or Allah, that that's what they were talking about. But why they decided to turn it into a man with a beard, I never quite understood. You know, it was just, it was just something huge and wonderful. And here we are with our beards, William, here we are, uh, indeed, years yeah. later. Uh, so, oh, yeah. so gateways then. So one gateway is beauty, right? This uh, something so beautiful. Another gateway I heard you mention there was love. You know, something that's a sexual aspect of that. It was for me at 16. It really yeah. dragged me into my body and emotions in a way I wasn't expecting. 
And you're lucky. Um, you're lucky to have had that embodied experience as a teenager. I, I all credit to Sally. I think yeah. is, the, is the, the key, the key credit there, Jim. Yeah. So instantly, it's I'm just, not, it's I'm just, not. just, to, just to say, because this is a good, this is a good topic for people. Right. I think just to say, as a teenager and in my early twenties, I was having intimate relationships with people I love, right. but I wasn't opening up. I wasn't flowing with it. I wasn't embodied, and it took the actual experience of falling head over heels into chemistry to bring me. In, suddenly go work what is this oh this is my body i'm having pleasure and feeling in the whole of my body right but i think a lot of people do have intimacy do have sex but don't have any experience other than a kind of <coughs> a shiver of climax i i thought everybody did i thought that was just what sex was until i had sex with someone i didn't love quite so much a year later and i was like oh well that was pleasant but in no way you know, I would say, well, you know, I started asking, don't you have blinding white lights and don't you have transcendent losing yourself in the ocean of the other? And people were like, uh, no, I just come and it feels nice. Um, so I was like, oh, okay. I thought that was what it was. Um, so I guess I was lucky. Um, and then you also mentioned something which is, I guess, a theme I've, I've heard in another interview of yours, which is when people can get into the you know, transcendent or the esoteric or the new age, sometimes it's a bit of an up and out thing you know lots of visualizing lots of sort of rainbows and unicorns and you describe it elsewhere as getting into the marrow of the body i think it's a taoist term i believe yeah say a little bit about that because that's the kind of you know the embodiment well, you, you, yeah but i mean you, you you're talking about an extreme polarity there mm. one at one end of the spectrum we have people who for one reason or another enjoy the self-soothing and the escape that comes from visualizations and transcended experiences that are dissociated from their bodies. Often they're folk that are introverts and very sensitive, therefore they don't like the impact of human interaction. And often, in my opinion, from experience, there are also people who've suffered some kind of trauma, trauma. and it's safer for them to be out of the body. Now, at the other end of the spectrum, we have a internal martial arts exercise, for example, uh, bone marrow breathing, where in a state of being deeply at ease and, and embodied in, in martial arts, you call it inhara, a term which I assume you're very familiar with, right? Um, but inhara, you then, as you connect with the, um, what's the right language here, the energy field of the cosmos, the waves of the Tao, whatever you call it, that you allow that sense of connection to be breathed deep into your bones. And then the advice is in that form of internal martial arts, do it softly. Softly is what lands it deep in the bones. And it's an interesting paradox between the discipline of daring to do it and the softness required to land it. And is there, if we can think of a trap or a mistake, you know, one end of the spectrum is the leaving the body, the transcendent, the escapism maybe. And I think that's pretty well documented in the sort of critiques of the new age. And I'm, I'm associated with that personally. And then I wonder, you know, for someone like myself, who's much more sort of imminently orientated, like I like fucking and fighting, you know, like, like I, that was me as a young man, particularly. And as I've got older, you know, I've started to be, be more interested in Qigong and Tai Chi and, you know, more subtle things. Like, is there a risk at the other end of the spectrum? Is it just being closed minded? Is it being a bit stuck in the mud? Like, what's the risk of the other end of the spectrum? Well, the risk is worse than what you've just named. Okay. The, the, the risk is bullying because pe people who are deep in their bodies and have a sense of their own physicality, like, say, let's take it as an extreme example a sumo wrestler, right? Okay. There's no necessary connection, is there, between that? embodiment him being deeply in horror and him having a kind heart so yeah, for maybe example, an mma fighter even yeah like a cage yeah, fighter yeah. Yeah. i mean i i was a i was a biker i rode in a bike club i rode not a member of the english hell's angels and so i'm very familiar with men who use their physical presence in order to frighten other people uh -huh. right uh -huh. and they don't even think about it they may like fighting they yeah, just yeah, yeah. come in and their bodies are oomphy. So oomphy, is that a new clinical term for um, aggressive? Anyway. Say it again. I just again. made it oomphy, <laughs> I said. Oomphy, <laughs> so, um, having oomph. Yeah. So 
I, I, you know, so much so in terms of your question about other polarities, yes, that the, the yeah. person is deeply embodied and a strong, physically confident, able to fight person, that 1000% needs to be balanced with chivalry mm -hmm. and an opening of the heart to kindness and love. Otherwise, it's just, it's just a hefty beast in the um, jungle who can get their way. Yeah, there's a power there that's developed, and I'm aware of that temptation for sure. I can dominate, for example, without too much difficulty. Even not physically, you know, I don't have to physically threaten anyone, just with presence. That's possible compared to the average British guy, though here in Russia it's a little bit more tricky. But certainly you see that it's, archetype, it's, quite, it, it, yeah, the that archetype quite commonly in Russia. <laughs> yeah. the Russian culture, uh, violence is more upfront. Aggression, creative aggression yeah. is much more upfront. Yeah. But, but the point here is, you know, especially as someone who's, I speak as someone who's a, um, deeply into metaphysics, I do not see any other purpose to embodiment mm -hmm. than to radiate kindness into humanity and help shift the species. If you're just, going to, if you're just going to radiate kindness in order to be a better boss, I mean, in, just, just, if you're just going to en enable embodiment in order to see it in capitalism, I'm not very interested. So spiritual materialism, embodied materialism, right? Like I can be more embodied so I can, um, you know, I don't know, make more money or be a better pickup artist yeah. or, you know, something on, like that. On, on, yeah. on the other hand, my 26 year old daughter at the moment is doing boxing mm. and it's great. It's great that she's doing boxing. It's just good for her. It's I, really, I... really good in terms of bringing her into the body. <laughs> my, my wife, Sabrina, um, she started uh, Taekwondo at the age mm. of 50. She's now second down wow. black belt and competing, you know, Very and cool. you can see how good it is for them to have that embodied confidence, you know? Yes. yes but then I, on the, I, on the other hand, <laughs> you know, ex-biker, blah, blah, blah. I needed to soften. Who's it for, right? Like I, last night I was teaching um, Japanese weapons in a quite aggressive way to um, a group of young Russian women. And I said, so, you know, for some of you, this is wonderful medicine. For others, you should not do this at all. <laughs> this is going to be terrible for you. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's finding the right medicine for the right person, right? What, why did you think it would be terrible for them? Uh, well, some of them are already sort of sharpened swords uh, mm -hmm. as human beings. And the last yeah. thing they need is, you know, something that makes them even more <laughs> deeply neurotic in their concurrent control pattern. Um, yeah, whereas others, you know, there's one young lady, for example, who lacked confidence and she didn't have much extension in her whole body and holding the sword just gave her this wonderful feeling of extension. I thought, oh, that's beautiful. That's so good for you. Please do this every day. You know, so that was, you know, some ones I took aside and said, maybe this is a good practice for you. You've also mentioned sort of ethics and service here, William, in a way I really like in that, you know, sometimes, for example, in the modern meditation, mindfulness, secular mindfulness or yoga world, for example, there isn't always an emphasis on service. Like I don't hear service mentioned in a yoga. It's, you know, it feels good. Uh, you know, we get kind of like a natural high and it's good for us. And maybe ethics is mentioned, you know, yamas and niyamas, but service and this idea of sort of being good for the planet is often not really considered. So I, it's lovely to hear that mentioned. Mm -hmm. I mean, the current, it's, it's sad for me as a, mm. as a kind of ex sixties hippie type radical to see what's happened to meditation in the woke generation, that, that, that one element of it has been very successfully commercialized and marketed, which is the self-soothing element oh. of it. And I'm glad to see that. I'm glad yeah. to see the self-soothing. But that is only a very minor part of full and deep meditation. A much bigger part of meditation is that it's a, it is a spiritual practice. And when I, when you would, if you would say to me in the pub, what do you mean by spiritual practice then? I, I would say. I wanted to ask you about it as well. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I would respond. It's you working day by day on becoming more compassionate, more loving, more kind, and more conscious and awake and having an expanded consciousness that's and the whole of those two packages serving the community of humanity and all other beings on this planet. It's it, meditation is a spiritual practice, and in it, once you get past the self-soothing stage, you start to connect with 
more interesting things in, in your consciousness and in your sense and experience of what's going on. And um, I'm sure that will come, but at the moment we're in a very um, commercial stage of... Um, it's almost enabling, isn't it? Self-soothing is a sort of enabling to deal with the fact that the planet and the economy and the injustices and all that's going on. That, but, but don't worry, do some yoga, do some mindfulness with your app, and then you'll feel good. Well, well hang on a minute. If the planet's being set on fire and you know, inequality is r- rampant, maybe we shouldn't be feeling good all the time. Maybe it might be quite a nice wake-up call to feel the distress of walking out into a polluted Moscow street and realising the air is full of crap. You know, then maybe self-seeding isn't ideal. Yeah, but but you as a martial artist, Mark, you know that in actual fact, the solution is to be embodied, calm, and precisely <laughs> at the same time, noticing all the risks. Right, right. Yeah, that, I mean, this that, is the benefit how, of self right? Effective action can only yeah. be taken from a place of calm yeah, and center. love. Yeah, if you're, not, if you're not centered in calm... I, I used to teach foreign policy analysis in, uh, at uni, actually, at one point, and... I'd, my doctorate was in international relations and psychology and it, over and over again we just keep meeting that these stupid decisions are made when people in the foreign ministries get excited interesting excited that's a very yeah, excited word. They, lose, they lose their center they lose their right. center and they go into group think they just start thinking stupidly and so i'm, I'm 100 percent with you P- people need to be centered embodied and at the same time aware fully conscious of what's going on around them. And that's courageous and disciplined and strong behavior. Nice, nice. It's, it's interesting at the moment, I'm leading the embodiment conference and we've got the run up to that right now. Yeah. I speak to sort of a couple of my, I've got a coach around this and you know, she was, she was basically saying, look, your job is, is to keep calm enough to not make any terrible decisions. <laughs> and be a little bit calmer than all the people panicking that work with you. Yeah. And I was, I was like, that sounds a fairly low bar. But then I thought, well, actually, if the average politician was to do those two things, we'd be in a much better place. You know, so, so that's my modest aim, William, for the next three weeks yeah. is to not panic and make any horrible decisions and be a little bit less stressed than the people who work for me. Well, yeah, I, I think you're probably doing, I think you're underplaying it. I think something else happens with the, in good leadership is you, you are the person who actually, because you're centered and calm and watchful, you have the big picture. The vision. You're, you're the, the one the person. No, but not just the vision, but how the strategy is unfolding. Mm-hmm. You have the big mm-hmm. picture and you know how... A friend of mine, very, very close friend of mine, was one of the leader, leaders of the community arts movement. And he would come in with his team to um, build huge mosaics where there were community mosaics to, for, for disasters like the Aberfan disaster and stuff like that. There were thousands and thousands of pieces, and he was the leader of the project. And what he could do as the leader, which nobody else could do, was when a piece was put out of place, which would ultimately lead to the whole thing going wrong, Mm -hmm. he knew how to fix it. Interesting. Right. And I, I also lead a project, and I know that time after time, what I'm actually doing, apart from having a view on the strategy, is I'm the one, I can see a mistake, and I can edge it, nudge it back into the um, right direction and flow. And I think, that, I think you can only do that if you're centered and calm. Yeah, so this for you is a sort of essence of, of leadership and uh, informed by your work, by the sounds of things. I'm, obviously, this is very relevant to me right now. Yeah. I mean, spiritual leadership, what is that? Uh, for me, the major adding on to the things we've just spoken about, the major element for me is that as a lifestyle, I'm in Hara. Am I to assume your listeners know what, what we mean by Hara? Or not? They might not. I mean, okay. the, the, so in Hara would mean, in my definition would be, you're at ease deeply into your body. You're, in, you're, in, you're anchored down in your body. You feel comfortable. You're walking around in that state. <laughs> that it's most simple, right? And then from that center and place of being at ease and wise, even if there's a crisis going on, my heart and consciousness are open and I'm in a sense, in my consciousness and my heart, I'm holding everybody. It's like like I've got these wings extending out miles wide and I'm holding everybody in the project and I'm the one stable parental creature and 
if I become, if something goes wrong and I become hysterical temporarily, I lose the plot, right? Which is what happens, we're human, right? Sure. Yeah, I lose about once a week at least. Yeah, well done, yeah. <laughs> I know where to come home to. And right. what I do, I come home to is I land back in my body and I come back to holding the people. Holding them and then looking to see who do I have to bulldoze, who do I have to nudge, who do I have to inspire, you know. But it's holding, hold, holding them, I think is deep in what spiritual leadership is and you see it with wonderful self-sacrificing military officers sergeant majors on the field there they are in the battle on the field and they are aware of all their comrades you know they hold the space for them and they're aware they're not moving until they've got everybody back home you know there's, there's an awareness of everyone and you can walk into a i reckon i can walk into a school or hospital and I will know almost immediately whether the CEO walks through that school, that hospital holding space, whether they're embodied and at ease and holding space. And I've seen some wonderful models of that and some really, really bad ones. <laughs> it's good to have it. You know, William, I love you already. I really want to just keep you in my pocket for the next three weeks and just <laughs> occasionally get you out and say, what was that again, William? Yeah. Uh, this is some, some good advice for me for certainly. And, the other thing I've heard that you do, which I really like, is um, explain or help introduce the idea of spirituality in a very down-to-earth way. I, I think this is almost a sort of quite a British gift in a way, that if it's too esoteric, it can turn people off. But actually, everybody has a spirituality. Everyone has a way into this. And I've heard you, maybe you could talk about some of the ways you talk to the bloke down the pub. Yeah, I, I, I think the important thing, first of all, is this... this when I talk about spirituality or my mates talk about spirituality, we're keeping it really simple. We're saying it's your connection with the wonder and energy of life. And you may have different names for the wonder and energy of life. You may call it God, you may call it the Tao, you may call it Goddess, you may call it unity or the mystery. But, but it's, it's, I find in English anyway, that particular phrase, the wonder and energy, kind of, kind of, kind of works a bit, you know. There's always a tap dance in these conversations because people think you're going to lay a trip on them, you know. Right. So if we start from the premise of in the pub, right? What are you into? I'm into spirituality. Fuck off. No, really. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and then so what do you mean? I say connecting with the wonder and energy of life. What are you talking about? I say, okay, when do you connect with the wonder and energy of life? Do you connect it when your team wins or when you're with your children or when you're out in landscape or when you're sitting next to a stream? When do you connect? I don't know. I don't know. When, when is it for you? And they'll go, oh, well, that's an interesting question. You know? Very straight person, I, you know, well, yeah, well, actually, I quite like going for walks. So I was, there's this view I like, or I'm listening to this music and it works for me. And I said, there you go. There's your gateway. There's your way in. Everyone's got something, right? Yeah. Music, sex, yeah. sports, nature. For so many people in Britain, it's nature, isn't it? Like gardening, walking. Who doesn't have a spiritual experience, you know, in the Peak District, you know? Well, they, they, did, they did some research on who has spiritual experiences. And 70% yeah. of the feedback was that it happens out in landscape most easily for people. Yeah, so yeah. The, you think the, of how popular it is in the Lake District, the Peak District. Like, it's just full of people. No, I know. And these are regular people. These aren't Glastonbury or Brighton people like us. These are regular people from Manchester and Leeds and London. And people convalesce out in the landscape. Yeah, I, I was meaning to bike up to Snowdon, actually, a couple of weeks ago, and, and I was told that it was just completely packed. There was a queue yeah. of people. Yeah, a queue at a cafe. And yeah. this might not be obvious to people listening in the States. And our audience is sort of, you know, one quarter British, but quite a, even more from the States and other countries. And we, we do in Britain have this sort of native pagan influence spirituality, sort of land-based spirituality, don't we? Which is, um, if you live in Glastonbury, is pretty normal. But it yeah. might not be so obvious to listeners from other countries, you know, that, who, you know who are non-indigenous in a way. Like there is an indigenous spirituality to the UK, which is quite resurgent. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, there's a lot of witches and pagans in the UK, but there, there's a lot of them all over the world, actually. I mean, okay. you know, I, I study this stuff professionally because it's my biz, so to speak, you know. And um, th there's, there's a growing, huge surge of awareness that nature is, is a prime way that people connect with the metaphysical, with the spiritual. It's, um, you know where it was biggest actually in Europe? It was in Germany. 
in Germany. The, in Germany. Okay, I, know, I was in Hungary. It had a bit of a felt sense of it there. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we had. I grew up with maypole dancing in school. That's this right. huge you know, young ladies wrapping red ribbons around a phallic pole. I mean, this was normal thing for us every spring. You know, it had some sort of Christian trappings, but it wasn't really. Yeah, I've, I've done Morris dancing with bikers. <laughs> That's living the dream, right there. <laughs> it's, 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 it's noisy and raucous. So, so this sort of way in then, you just say, you know, what's, you know, what makes you feel fully alive or where's the wonder, the energy of life? or you look for those places where people are naturally having those transcendent experiences. So I, yeah, I don't even use the word transcendent because I think that's too posh. <laughs> I, I, I just, I just keep it as you're having, you're having, an, you're having an experience of the wonder and energy. Now the thing, the next thing is in terms of the coaching and teaching I do is I say to the person, do you want to deepen that? Right. Cause right. if you want, if you want to deepen it, there's some tools that everybody uses. And what, one of them, of course, is embodiment, right? So there, there you are having this experience of connection, don't care where and how it's happening. Could be watching television with your children, eating white bread, jam sandwiches, you know, if you're having that sense of connection, what you need to do is pause internally and go, oh, I'm having this experience. Notice it, first notice, stage. Notice it and allow yourself to go into the feeling of it the, the phrase i often use and it's different from a kind of martial arts approach is it's, it's like being in a warm bath and allowing yourself to soak mm -hmm. you know just just mm -hmm. be, be, like being a warm sponge letting warm water in and everybody knows the because i think you need to give people metaphors that work in real life so i say i can say to any even the most ardent bloke i can say look you know it's like you you, you get in a warm nice bath and you could get out quickly, but there comes a moment when you go, oh, I think I'm just going to stay in it a bit longer and relax. And yes. they go, yeah. They say, yeah, I know what that feels like. And so this is what we're talking about. So there you are. You've spotted a view you love. Just allow yourself to relax into it. Yeah, exactly. Like, like you make that noise. And I then, you know, a few hints about breath, a few hints about sinking down into the body, a few hints, more hints about abdominal breath, you know. And um, we've got people pretty centered and connected. Before you know it, they're doing embodied spirituality. Okay. So any other sort of basic stuff you do with people then? So it's like, okay, notice it, start to work with the breath a little bit. Like what, what are some of the ways to deepen that? If someone said, you know, I'm bloke down the pub. I, I don't really talk about spiritual stuff. I don't do chakras. I don't do meditation, but... I realized there's something going on when I go to the Peak District or in my gardening and I, I want to deepen that. Like, what are your other... So, so my... I use two very simple strategies, actually. Very, very simple, which you'll just go, yeah, I know that. But um, brackets, first of all, breath is good, except in my experience, one in 10 people go into panic if you ask them to stay with their breath. So you need to yes. be careful yes, about it. Yes, it makes them anxious, yeah. But what doesn't make them anxious is if they're asked to just do three or four breaths. Mm -hmm. And I, you'll hear me saying over and over again, we'll now take three or four soft, slow, silken, and I say explicitly, I don't want to hear you. Okay. Slow breaths down into your abdomen, three or four. And that just almost inevitably, impeccably, gives them a taste of what happens when the neuroendocrinal system is guided down into being at ease. There's somebody in the, in the driver's seat, there's somebody in the throne doing something that softens and puts the body at ease and allows them to be more receptive. I find that works impeccably. Wonderful. And you talked about endocrine systems. I mean, you're, you're known, I think, particularly for the endorphin effect book. Um, physiology and health as a way in you know yeah. really talking about like sort of concrete scientifically grounded health things it does seem that's still a big way in you know a lot of people are getting interested in in different things from a health orientation so anything you want to say about that no i think it it it, it, it makes sense doesn't it? i mean there are health systems classical traditions of medicine like ayurveda like taoist medicine where there was no separation between the science and physiology of the, of the medicine and metaphysics. 
because what they're going for that you will know probably better than me as a martial artist creature is that health is best defined as pain-free flexibility and bad health is a lack of flexibility with pain and um, so in Taoist martial arts internal martial arts Chinese medicine healing what you're trying to do is get the body back into that oceanic sense of flow with the universe with nature so there's no, again there's no separation between spiritual connection with um, the Tao with God goddess whatever you call it and being healthy and it's the same in Ayurveda as well and in a sense any um, body therapist more than a talk therapist the body therapist knows precisely that they're bringing their, 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 their whatever they're doing to their client is enabling their body to come back into a, a kind of open flow that's that's pain free and flexible again and that's part of the way <clears throat> me as a metaphysician would say that's part of the way the energy field of the cosmos is it's a big ocean and it flows and has streams in it it's very Taoist what you're saying. You mentioned Taoism a couple yeah. of times. It actually doesn't come up that often in interviews. People want to mention Buddhism, which I love, sometimes Hinduism, you know, from the yoga background. Yeah. So um, you've actually just reminded me of something. That the first copy of the Tao Te Ching I ever read was from the girl I mentioned earlier. Oh, yeah. Uh, I've just made this weird connection 24 Thank years you. later. So, um, your most important teacher. It see it just she just had a birthday a couple of days ago, so maybe yeah. she was on my mind. Yeah. But um, yeah, wow. Okay, so do you want to say a little bit about Taoism and what that is? Because it isn't as well known as, as sometimes Buddhism, Hinduism. Do you think so? Um, actually, not in a lot of embodiment okay. circles. I think in in internal martial arts, of course, but outside yeah. of the Qigong Tai Chi world, not so much actually. Okay. Well, in, in so I'll tell you, my, my part of my background is. I did three years psychoanalysis, talk therapy, blah, 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 blah. Very helpful. I was also into pagan and Western mystery, magic, esoteric Christianity. And in those spiritual systems, there are visualizations where you put inside your body, for example, a tree of life, and you feel it and sense it, and you move energy around the tree of life inside your body. So there, there are traditions across the world where there are embodiment exercises that involve visualizations. But Taoism is the most explicit, for me anyway, is the most explicit model of how to move energy through your body. And all the exercises of Tai Chi and Qigong, for me, are students being taught, look, these are examples of how to move your body and feel the way energy moves inside you. And when you've learned how to move your body and feel the energies inside you, go free form and live your life with that sense of feeling and freedom. And so I hugely recommend to people who's, who are looking to be embodied to do some Tai Chi or some Qigong. But you'll be glad to hear me say this. If they are people who are not embodied and lack confidence, lack confidence, I'm continually nagging them to go and do a hard martial art for six months. Particularly young, young guys, I found. Yeah, you know, young guys. Well, I'm, a, I'm a father of young women, you know, so I particularly want them to be able to assert clear boundaries. That too, that too, for sure. Yep, for sure. Yep, definitely uh, some cultural pieces in there too. There's a lot of yeah. English women that I find don't have that, that clear no, particularly a certain generations. So the younger generation, maybe you're getting it a bit more. But um, yeah, the importance of... Uh, I've only just sort of come to the softer martial arts over in time. You know, I started mm -hmm. off with sort of hard, with classic journey of more hard styles to more soft. Um, and not, this idea of sort of the soft and the flexible and the flowing, you know, it's very Taoist kind of idea, isn't it? Looking at balance, looking at softness and flow as signs of health. Yeah. Well, I, th I think one of the challenges is when, when, when you're in your teens and 20s and 30s, you're still looking to pose into life. So you actually, it's more important to you that you look vibrant and toned right. than feel healthy. Right, it's so the outside look. And this is yeah. a, maybe a challenge in our culture as well, is yeah, it really yeah. reinforces but, but, the outside. But it's natural, isn't it? In your 20s, you think you're, it's natural? You, yeah, yeah you're, you're looking to mate and you're looking to show off. And okay. Rest, you know, when you, you get older 
and that's, <laughs> that starts to fall away. You suddenly realize that all those strategies are in actual fact meant to soften in order to create genuinely good health, genuinely good health. And genuinely good health is, I said earlier, flexibility without pain, you know. Mm, so to mm. be beautifully toned and muscular and all the rest of it, you know, it's actually relatively meaningless. It's a nice way of posing. It's a bit of glamour, mm -hmm. you know, but it's not, it's, not, it's not meaningful. I do see a trend in our culture, though, which really wants to keep that going. So, you know, yogis in middle age who are still seem to be very much into the posing aspects yeah. and the external aspects. It, I wonder if we're trying to prolong one of the less healthy stages of youth. Human beings will be human beings, won't they? I think it's just, I think, I think it's just natural that we all have our little peccadilloes and wanting to look nice and good and be cool and all the rest of it. You know? We have to... A lot of us have to go through some kind of crisis or illness before we get slapped across the face and wake mm -hmm. up to, I don't know, there's, there's a little bit more to it than this. You know? I was very lucky. I had a very, very bad illness in my, when I was 26 that laid me out. I, didn't, I couldn't walk properly or run for three or four years. And it, I, it, I, I, give, I give big thanks for that lesson. You know? One of my keto teachers, he was dying of cancer at the time, and I was in very close physical contact with him while he had late stage cancer because I was yeah. just throwing, throwing me around every day. Um, he used to say, Mark, you need to get old before you get old. And what yeah. he meant by that was to sort of, you know, realize you're falling apart, realize that your strength will fade. Your, you know, I was quite athletic at that time. Your athleticism will fade. And he was sort of trying to convey this to me. And I, I, I'm, I'm hoping he at least shaved a few years off the understanding, you know. But uh, sometimes I feel like I learn the hard, slow way a bit too often. Yeah, uh, but you, you know, our body will create crises and illness for us until we learn the lesson. So, so in terms of psychosomatic illness, is that a part of your work? I think I've come across that in your work before. Well, yeah, I mean, the point is, I don't want to sound like a clever dick here. I don't want to, I don't want to sound cocky because I don't want anybody suffering. That's mm. number one. I don't want people to suffer. But when we are ill and when we are suffering and when we are in pain you, you, you've got a couple of ways to go one is whinge and be a victim two is give away your power to medics and the third is in the middle of it in the middle of the suffering and the illness and the pain is to wake up and midwife midwife yourself into self-management and consciousness and self-care proper self-care and um I think my experience is a lot of people who wake up to personal development, spiritual development, are people who've gone through health crises and gone, what? Oh, I can't just be a victim. Then, and something yeah. in their consciousness wakes up. Either a health crisis or a, some kind of an emotional crisis. Mm -hmm. this, 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 this something that wakes people up. I, mean, I, I'm, I also don't like to see people suffer. So sometimes I'm wondering, is there a way to do that without quite so much suffering? to kind of wake people up to that yeah, possibility. That be, yeah, but I mean, I pray for waves of grace, which is, well, there's growth without suffering for me, grace. Uh -huh, uh -huh. I pray for tsunamis of grace all the time, for myself, for everybody. Right? But the stuff I've been working on in myself that's hanging around for decades, you know, I can't, can't quite get rid of that little bit of whatever it is you know family yeah. it's usually irritability with family you know yeah 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 that's that's the, one of the toughest ones yeah okay uh, and then sort of the endorphin thing do you want to say a little bit about that as it's as a bit of your sort of specialist dish so in uh, anything in that or is it sort of old hat now no the, the bit i love about it is isn't it wonderful that nature or evolution or what or, or creation or whatever it is has made it so that if a human being pauses and focuses down with kindness and care into their own body, that that triggers a neuropeptide response that feels good. Isn't that wonderful? That when, when, you, when you have an attitude that's kind to your own body, when you have some pain in your body and you mm -hmm. pause and you turn your focus down to it with kindness, that triggers 
a response of feel-good hormones. I, th I think that's a very clever piece of um, design or evolution, or whatever you want to call it. And um, what I love about it is that when people do that particular practice of being kind to their own bodies, the inner smile, that at the same time as they do the inner smile, there's a part of their brain mind that's waking up and becoming something different, which is kind to itself. And I think that's very useful for people. In fact, I, I, I've, you know, we had this begin began the conversation talking about bullies and people who are embodied and um, too aggressive with it. And I said I wanted people to be loving and kind. I, th I think the other thing I want to say is when the, the that part of your consciousness that's guiding you to be embodied that says, "All right, I'm now going to relax. I'm now going to be in my body." I want that part of our consciousness, that part of our mind, to be very kind to ourselves. You know, the best possible parent. And I think that's absolutely crucial because if you've got your internal parent being kind, um, it grows your consciousness and it's good for your health. You say it's quite phenomenal that we're um, wired for self-kindness and connection as well as um, just fight or flight. Mm -hmm. And that, that actually we can, you know, produce these measurable physiological benefits that also subjectively feel lovely, mm -hmm. um, you know, natural heroin, you know, pretty, pretty full on, um, have pain killing effects, have emotional soothing effects, have all sorts of benefits physiologically that we would otherwise have to medicate in less healthy ways. And they're actually wired for that. You know, people make out like we're just wired for fight or flight, but we're not. We're measured for tender befriend and connection to ourselves. And, you know, we've got our own sort of benign inner drug dealer ready to go. You know? <laughs> yeah, you say inner drug dealer. I, I, I say uh, the most beautiful parent is sitting <laughs> inside one's psyche, right? You know, a good example for people to understand is if, if, if they watch an opera singer who understands this, if an opera singer hits a duff note, like they, they squawk, it will happen because their throat muscles are, or their chest muscles are, have gone fractionally too tense in, in that moment. If in that moment they then internally criticize themselves for getting that bad note, mm -hmm. they send messages from the brain through the neuroendocrinal system that trigger more adrenaline cortisol. So they tense up and that makes their voice even worse. So when you watch great opera singers hit a duff note, the next thing you'll see them do is they look like a bouncer outside a club. You'll see them, their hands will come down on their stomach, their chin will come down and they'll smile down into their bodies. Mm -hmm. They're smart. It's just typical bouncer body language. You know, it's, it's, I'm not taking any notice of the provocation that's going on outside me. I'm mm. staying lovely and cool, right? I'm Mr. Mujagi, Mugabe, Mujagi. Mr. Miyagi, Mr. Miyagi, <laughs> Mr. Miyagi, you know, I'm at ease in my body and I'm not taking any notice of what goes wrong. And in that way, my body drops down to being at ease is more flexible. And I sing a beautiful note or I avoid that punch more gracefully. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice. I'm taking some notes here, by the way, if you see me tapping my phone. Anything else we haven't talked, I'm gonna to need to go soon, just because yeah. I'm desperate for the toilet, but um, that's gonna be the natural end to our interview. Um, okay. But we, I've, got, I've got five minutes left in me at least. So um, is there anything you haven't talked about that you'd like to talk about that's sort of a, a live for you right now? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's, this relates to COVID. Great, um, let's bring it right to the present moment. Yeah, yeah I, I think the gift that those of us who are embodied can give is that, you know, we were talking about leadership and leadership, spirit, we're talking about spiritual leadership and I, I'd rather, maybe in a sense, I'd rather call it holistic leadership that's aware of the full picture. That uh -huh. if we can be embodied at ease in our bodies, with kindness and a warm heart and care. That is the crucial behavior required in a crisis. Yes. And that transmits to other people. So whether, whatever you think about vaccination, 
whatever you think about the source of COVID, whatever you think about how government is managing COVID, our job is to just be embodied and a calming influence. Our species has seen many plagues. Mm -hmm. This is not this is not our first rodeo. This is yeah. not our first rodeo. It, it will come and pass. Our species has also seen many demagogues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They come and go as well. And our job, as those of us who are conscious, our job is to stay embodied, calm, kind, and dignified, and have that as a radiating aura and behavior that will comfort and calm people and will also remind um, those who are being hysterical on both sides of the arguments because there are many arguments going on. What I like about kind in body leadership, if I could step in there just briefly, is, is independent of opinion, yeah. right? Like I could be with people who I agree with or disagree with. Yeah. I could not give an opinion. I could give an opinion. It doesn't matter. The, 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 the kind of body leadership is independent of those agree or disagree, really? left or right, whatever it is. Yeah. And, and, and you wait until you can see that a useful communication can happen. Otherwise, I just, just keep quiet. Waste, wasting my breath otherwise, right? Yeah. 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 Nice. Nice. Okay, William, where do people find out about you? Where do they go if they want to kind of look at your stuff more? 26 mm -hmm. books. So. Mm -hmm. William Bloom, one word, dot com. William Bloom, Bloom, dot like com. flowers that bloom in the spring, William Bloom dot com. There's loads of videos and audio on it and some of the books and lots of articles and stuff. And a closing message about the body, William, before I have to go pee. This has been brilliant, by the way. I hope <laughs> we become friends. I'll definitely look you up when I'm in the West Country. I really cool. enjoyed this. I, yeah, I think... Nice. I just love your style so much. I'm so glad Adrian put me on to you when we've got you coming to the conference, of course. Super welcome there. Yeah. So um, oh, please, please come and say hello. Come and have a bevy. Um, hey, everybody listening to this. Be embodied, be well and model for other people. Model for other people. Dignified, generous, calm behavior. Thank you so much, William, for joining us today. Lots of love to you all.